So a uh, brief overview of the talk. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Makamoto's Way for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Um, it's something that, that uh, we talk about from time to time in this business, and uh, I think it's washing over. I think you'll see it's washing over us again. Uh, we'll talk about three markets in perspective. Um, in the title, we talk about you know IoT because of course everyone's talking about IoT. We also talk about some some things up in the uh, data rooms and uh, base stations, and we'll talk about another market which is near and dear to many of our hearts in this room. And then we talk a bit about what can we do to help. So um, this is a, uh, a version of the, the famous Makamoto Wage diagram. Um, Sugio, Dr. Sugio Makamoto, who was then at Hitachi Systems uh, in 1987, first noticed that in the semiconductor industry, we tended to oscillate between periods of time in which we were very focused on standardization versus periods of time in which we focused more on customization. And he noticed this again in 1987 um, and had predicted at that point that some things would happen. They didn't all happen exactly the way he did, but of course, you know, like all good predictors, he got to update his predictions. So this particular version of the slide is one that he presented uh, at uh, the Global Semiconductor Association in 2012. Um, at this point, he was pretty interested in uh, the space of, of, or had been interested for a while in the space of field programmable devices. And he put SOCs kind of way down here as a wave starting in 2007, which I think is a little bit late. Um, so my view, the, the cycle that you know, is still in bold here um, has been delayed and very different than what he, and how he described it. Um, what I would argue is, while there's no doubt there's been enormous strides in the area of field programmable devices, especially FPGAs, um, over this period of time, and the total number of people building systems who are working with FPGAs as a, as a primary method of doing their design has absolutely exploded in this period. Um, the devices that most of us are carrying around in our pockets or using when we're at home are not driven by FPGAs. They're driven by uh, application-specific standard products. Um, I'll also say that the customization wave didn't happen in 2007, as he would predict, but I'll, I'm going to submit to you that that started again about in 2010. And we probably didn't actually cross the threshold until 2012. And I would argue that that gradual transition shown here seems to be a lot steeper right now than it is in a normal cycle. So I'm going to redraw Dr. Makamoto's um, wave in a different way so I can try to change it around a bit. Um, as I had just mentioned, I'm going to argue we have to think about FPGAs as being part of the, of the, of the most recent wave. And I'm going to argue that the curve looks more like this. That there's roughly a five-year wider window. Instead of having a half period of 10, 10 years, I would argue this cycle has had a half period more like 15 years. Um, you know, in 19, the fall of 1996, there was an organization founded called the Virtual Socket Interface Alliance, or VSIA, of which, you know, ST was a, uh, a major contributor that was focused on enabling standards for this new emerging field of SOCs. And it certainly has been the case that in the time frame of about 97 or 98, we saw the rise of application specific standard products, which is the, what the term ASSP really means, um, in consumer focused markets, things like TV and set top box chips, and of course, the very, all the very famous chips for mobile devices. Um, in that period of time, the complexity of doing these designs, the costs associated with doing the designs, and the risks of failing drove system companies away from doing these kind of SOCs. You know, they, the ASICs that they had been building in 1996 didn't translate into ASIC SOCs for most of those companies. That was a very big disappointment for the company that I started in the fall of 1996 called Sonics because we originally believed that SOC would be system engineers at system companies defining chips using an ASIC model. We were exactly wrong by 180 degrees. We were 180 degrees out of phase with Makamoto's wave, which was actually going exactly the opposite direction of time. Um, the result of all this, I think, is that the cycle of standardization has lasted maybe five years longer than what we would normally predict in, in this model. 
and I'll say that it changed in 2010. I'm saying now that we've entered a, a new realm. I don't have a good term. I'm using the term ASIC SOC because I don't have anything better. Hopefully someone who actually does this market stuff for a living will come up with a better term for this. So, so what happened to ASSPs? So, I mean, our industry, you know, every, the, what you see, you know, printed in the, in the, uh, in the news magazines and newspapers, um, and this conference in particular, have been dominated. I think the first time I came was maybe 2000. Um, with talks and, and, and enablement of cellular baseband and application processors. Um, they were the highest integration SOCs that, that we got a chance to work on. They were the highest volume SOCs pretty quickly. Um, and they had incredibly fast production ramps, which meant e the economics behind them were, you know, kind of staggeringly interesting. Um, they exhibited huge improvements in performance, um, huge improvements in the amount of features they were trying to integrate into a design. And they ran into substantial issues with respect to trying to manage either peak power or energy to try to you know, extend battery life and things like that. So it was a really interesting thing to work on. And so they drove us all. They, they drove the EDA tool vendors, they drove the IP vendors in very specific ways. Um, no big, re no, no surprise for that. These S ASSP chips were taking, you know, huge design teams. They had the biggest design teams, so as a result, they had the, the uh, problems that were most economically interesting to solve. <laughs> because if you can solve a problem that helps a thousand-person design team, you can probably sell it for more money than a problem that helps a ten-person design team. And so in many of the companies that were deploying them, these large ASSP projects became the place to try new methodologies, new tools, new IP, and even to drive new standards. We have a whole consortium, the, the MIPI Standards Organization, of which ST is a founding member, um, that exists really to drive standards for this segment of the market um, because of the complexities involved. However, most of the people that we would consider to be customers of folks in this audience have exited this space. There's too many of them to list. I, I started to make a list and I said, I, it's too depressing. I don't want to make a list of all the people who got out of this business. Um, to me personally, the most shocking one was, was TI. Um, they had the number one market share in application processors. And I think by most estimates, the number one share in baseband chips in 2010, although they weren't chips of TI's design. And by 2012, they'd announced they were exiting the market. I mean, I'm not familiar with many markets in which you go from being number one to out of the market in two years. It's, it's a pretty stunning change. So kind of what happened? Well, if, if we went through the whole theory of Makimoto's wave, he actually kind of predicts some of these things about what happens. But, but in the case of ASSPs, I think it's pretty easy to talk about. Um, the investments required for the semiconductor companies to participate in this business were huge, up to $200 million for a single design. I, I know of teams that were more than 1,000 people. Had, they had to write, not, they had to not just deliver this incredibly complex chip, but they had to deliver millions of lines of software code to run on it for free. I mean, bundled with the price of the chip, right? Um, a, uh, you know, Makimoto's Wave talks about standardization versus customization. But another word for standardization in a market that is interesting is commoditization. You know, if it's, if it's standardized and other people can do it, they will do it if there's money to be made. And so there were so many vendors attacking these sockets that it gave the system vendors almost complete control over the price. The result of that is the ASSP companies are designing the bulk of the electronic system. That's kind of the S in the SOC, right? But all they're able to realize is the manufacturing value. The customers reverted to a model where basically the SOCs were being priced based upon the number of square millimeters inside the package. It had nothing to do with the value being created at the system level. 
And so you look at the economic model of these large SSPs and they're just fundamentally broken. So what do you do if you're a chip company and, and this is your business? You don't just give up. You try to figure out, well, if I'm going to, if I'm going to spend $200 million on a chip, uh, maybe I need to expand the number of markets this one chip can serve. Well, how do you do that? Well, you go out and talk to your customers and say, well, gosh, you know, yeah, I'm not really building that cell phone, but I'm doing this other thing. If you could add a couple more interfaces on it or a couple of specific things, I might be able to use the thing. So what we end up doing is we end up over-designing, right? We end up building these things that, that we, we sometimes call super chips. It's a chip that's too capable for any of the applications it's, in, it, it's interested in, but hopefully you can, you can manufacture it cheaply enough that it's still interesting. Um, some of these chips that we're familiar with had more peripherals than they had pins. And so you had, you know, incredibly complex logic just to multiplex the peripherals because for this use you'd have this set of peripherals and for that use you'd have that set of peripherals. But maybe most fundamentally, and this is the one that Makimoto talks about, if everything is commoditized, at what level can a system company actually differentiate their end device? And so, you know, that that's a, provides a pressure against the, the standardized, standardized model. When we were building devices that had many chips, well, you could provide your differentiation by the collection of chips you chose to assemble. But if the entire digital content has shrunk to a single chip, that chip defines the system. So it's difficult to differentiate. So fundamentally, these ASSP SOCs became a no-win business for most of the players. Okay, that's kind of the scary part. Um, so let's talk about three markets and, and kind of the dynamics of that. Obviously, I've been starting with the application processors as in, in my intro, so we'll continue on with the application processors. So in 2010, the application processor business already looked like a traditional consumer electronics business. What do I mean? Well, when we started Sonics, uh, we wanted to work on television chips because there was this idea that people were going to build what we now call smart TVs. Um, this is 96, so we're a little early, but um, they want to build smart TVs, so um, we're going to put internet into the TV chassis because everyone wants to read their email on their TV or something like that. Um, so we went looking, what's the economic model behind the television chassis? And we got this report and it said the average cost of the electronics inside a television chassis had been constant for 20 years at a total value of $25. In that business, the silicon vendors and the other electronics components, because it wasn't all silicon going, that $25 didn't go all to silicon, was about what can you do for me for the $7 that I have budgeted for your part this year. And, you know, if you didn't do enough new for that $7, well, then you might get designed out in favor of someone who could do a little more for that $7. Um, in the case of the application processor business for phones, it was what can you do for me for 50 square millimeters? Pretty much all the ones out there on the market ended up being about 50 square millimeters. That's kind of what Nokia and the other large buyers had budgeted in silicon area, which turned into silicon cost for their, for their platforms which ended up being somewhere between $10 and $20, depending upon what your purchasing power was. A uh, not largely noticed fact at that moment was in 2010, April, Apple announced their um, A4 processor, which first showed up in one of the iPad tablets. Um, and the A4 was 53 square millimeters, completely conventional. But instead of being stamped Samsung, it was stamped Apple, and it had some Apple, some actual Apple secret sauce in it, apparently. By 2011, Apple ships the, their next version, the A5, and it's a very different design. Uh, I think those are to scale. It's two and a half times bigger than what the rest of the market's building at that time. But that's crazy. They're going to lose all this money, right? It's two and a half times bigger, you know, I don't remember my silicon economics, but that means it's three or four times more expensive to manufacture, right? They're going to have a huge margin problem. Well, I guess we all know that Apple doesn't actually have a margin problem at all, right? They're, they're a system company. They, you know, 
If they're going to sell a phone for $700, does it really matter whether the chip costs them $10 or $20? If they sell 5% more phones, that was probably a good economic bet at the margins they're making. Um, why would they do this? Well, they want to differentiate. They were able to deliver a part that had much higher graphics performance than what everyone else did. I think a lot of the area on there is in a GPU, I believe, a set of GPUs. It allowed them to give a better user experience. It made their phones more competitive. This sounds like Makamoto's wave, right? We're going towards customization. By 2012, um, TI has announced they're exiting the application processor business. I think that's the year when it became clear that ST was headed in the same direction as they announced their intention to split from, from the ST Ericsson Alliance and, and pull it back inside. Um, you know, by now where we are today, there's really only three effective players in smartphone application processors. Apple, who designs for themselves. Samsung, who designs largely for themselves, although they don't always end up winning their own internal sockets, and as a result, they sometimes sell on the open market. Uh, MediaTek and Qualcomm. Gosh, I forgot Qualcomm. Sorry about that. Qualcomm? Yeah, I forgot Qualcomm, clearly. Sorry about that. Okay, let's look at another business. Totally different, yet related. Um, cellular base stations. You know what? You know, we, we all love our little devices. The little devices con connect to these big things, or what used to be big things, um, these cellular base stations, which, of course, is the, the place where the uh, network operators um, per make huge investments, not only in buying spectrum, but in building equipment that actually allows you to terminate your LTE calls. Um, traditionally, those things were built as large boards that were stuffed with originally single-core DSPs and then you know, dual-core DSP chips, and then a, a set of microcontroller chips around it to kind of control everything and make it all work, and then a fair amount of mixed signal and stuff too. Um, that was a pretty high-valued ASSP business for a number of the players in the game. Um, as we moved in networking technologies up into 4G and LTE and things like that, the increased network speeds and the requirements that we get more base station per cubic meter um, because of the, you know, running out space and the cost it was to actually secure the physical plants and things meant that power density became a huge issue in that space. Um, and so people were driven to higher integration. We're going to move away from simple ASSPs and we're going to move towards these horribly complex, heterogeneous, high performance, higher performance than an application processor, uh, multi-core SSCs with very complex memory hierarchies and all the stuff that comes along with getting to an architecture that starts to look a bit like a computer. Um, what happens? The development costs escalate. It starts to look less and less like an ASSP business. Um, at the same time, there is this pressure to continue to in decrease the size of the base station, to improve coverage. As we move to higher data rates and higher frequencies, it becomes desirable to make the cells physically smaller. And so we start to hear about microcells and then picocells and now, and now femtocells. So we want to be able to have you know, very, very different sized cells. We want to have a cell in our office building or maybe in our home so that our people have better mobile access. Um, there's just no way. You cannot attack all of those submarkets with a single ASSP. So at the same time the development costs for these things are going through the roof, the available market is fragmenting and you have to have a lot of different, uh, at least derivative architectures. So it looks less and less like a standard product business. And so what happens? The ASSP, ASSP players all take a step back. They say, you know, I know we said this was our roadmap, but we're not going to be able to execute that roadmap. And so what's happened? If, you, if you're designing base station chips today and it's not a femto cell or one of the ones that could ship in very high volumes, you're working in a systems company today. You're not working in a standard product company at this point. That uh, became a big, um, big ASIC business again. And you know, companies like LSI Logic, who got bought by Avago and sold this group off to Intel in the last you know, year, um, you know, have big, roaring ASIC businesses again, you know, building these base station chips. Of course, the one everyone's been talking about, you know, the, the fabulous Internet of Things. I'll talk about the subset of that that we'll talk, that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about wearables. And I expected to put together some slides, you know, talking about that kind of the, the ludicrous idea of the, of the watch that can't tell time for a whole day. But everyone's already done that already, so I don't have to do that one again. Um, 
you know, right now it's the next billion unit opportunity. However, it stands at a current ticker of less than one of less than one billion units, so it rounds down to zero still. So it's a zero billion unit opportunity right now, and and they're stuck in a conundrum. Um, wearables only make sense if the if they're small enough from a form factor perspective and have a long enough battery life that people will actually choose to wear them. That means we have to be pretty highly integrated, it turns out. But we as, as, as silicon people don't know how to integrate to unsure specifications. How do we integrate something if we don't know what we're integrating? You know, what, what, what are the goals? What, what, are we trying, what market are we trying to serve? What, what are the required features? We don't really know. So how can any semiconductor company really engage this market in any effective way at this point when the market end user requirements are so unclear. Traditionally, we would have done a set of simpler chips and let the system company mix and match and assemble to do that. Unfortunately, we now know from the early examples that that results in a end device that is not small enough and does not have a long enough battery life to be attractive. So we're forced in the situation that I, I, I uh, think I invented this term. Uh, we're forced in this, this situation where we're um, suffering from premature integration. Um, we're being forced to integrate before the market is ready for that level of integration. And so one of the technology challenges associated with IoT isn't that we don't know how to integrate, it's that we don't know what to integrate. So how are we going to do that well? My perspective is the only system companies are close enough to the end user to be able to make these bets. It costs money to integrate this stuff. They're the ones who are going to have to stick their neck out and say, I think someone would build a device that looks like this and therefore I'm willing to pay to build a chip that, that does that. Of course, even they don't know, <clears throat> so their actual requirement is to try to get into a cycle of rapid learning. You see that in the last year, I believe, or a little more than a year, Samsung has come out with five different smartwatches. They're trying to learn. Unfortunately, I think all of them have battery life problems still, but they're trying to learn. I don't know how much they're learning, but at least they're trying. I think that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of experimentation in the space. What features, costs, and benefits, you know, what's the right combination of things that will actually build an, an interesting device business? We believe targeted silicon is absolutely required. What I think the market has already shown is that if the prototype is not attractive, you won't get the learning. Not only won't it sell, you won't in any reasonable volume, you won't even get a small, a small enough volume to sell that you can even learn about what you should do better. All we know is it's not good enough yet. I think at this point the only model that has a prayer working is the, the larger system companies who are in this business for the long term are going to have to sacrifice costs. They're going to have to sell some of these products at a loss in order to get through the learning curve. That's not a new idea. It's an idea they've, they've practiced in the past, but I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to sacrifice cost because that's one of the things that obviously it ends up being an enabler. Of course, eventually these chips will be standardized and commoditized. Clearly, this will happen, but it's not going to happen before we know what we're building. Hard to standardize on something that still hasn't been customized. Okay, so how do we help? What can we do? If this is the, the re our new reality, you know, what should we be doing? So these new chips, these SOC A6, are going to require a bunch of new things. Why? We're talking about companies that by and large have shed their capability of doing this type of design. They're having to rebuild a chip design cap capability. And are they going to do that by going and buying a bunch of place and route tools? I don't think so. I think they're going to do that by trying to figure out where it is they have to master certain technologies. And we can help them by uh, providing the right collections of tools, IP, methodologies. In IP, you notice I didn't even put IP up here normally. I put it up here in the form of subsystems because I think that's the right model. 
you know, they, they probably don't want to buy a, a sensor IP. They probably want to buy a sensor subsystem. They want to buy something that is more abstracted. They don't want to ma have to master things at the level of bits and bytes and transistors and wires. They want to work at a higher level of abstraction because they don't want to build a 1,200 person design team to try to build a chip that eventually needs to be a dollar. We have to deal with this huge difference in the cost of doing design. Um, and of course, they're going to need high efficiency approaches to integration, which is where, of course, you know, we think a company like Sonics has, has some value to offer. Um, maybe fun pictures. I love these pictures. So, you know, this is Google Glass, right? I don't know if, if you've all seen this picture of the original prototype. That, that literally is a smartphone that's strapped to, the, to his face. And, and sensors, I, I, should, I should blow that picture up sometime. If you've never gone and seen that picture, go on the internet and go look at the picture of the original prototype of Google Glass. It's, it's really quite funny. Um, you know, and so then, then, then it gets shrunk to like a, I don't know if that's a beagle board or what, but you know, it's a printed circuit board attached to her, her temple and then eventually becomes something interesting. Um, there's some pretty unique challenges. And there's a whole bunch of ideas about what we might want to build. We got this, you know, we got the problems we just talked about, form factor, battery life. I believe the requirement is rapid prototyping. I think that's the only, one of the key technologies that's going to enable this is an ability to get these um, early versions done more quickly. Again, that's how I, that's my suggestion for how we could sacrifice cost. So it's not that I have to have the smallest possible die because I, there's no reason to optimize the die size until I know what people want to buy. Let's get something in there. I mean, the, the old idea of putting chips on a board would be great if only could get to the right power levels. What I need to do is I need to get a chip at an acceptable power level, acceptable form factor, done as quickly as possible. And that means we sacrifice cost. So, um, so what could we do that could do that? Well, unfortunately, the power of an FPGA doesn't work. The form factor in FPGA doesn't quite work. But there are some interesting technologies that have been introduced into our market recently that are derived off of gate arrays. <laughs> we used to do gate arrays. That was, that was kind of a common, common idea a long time ago. And with a, many fewer masks and a lot less design time, we can actually use some of these new generation gate array technologies. Well, what's different about these gate array technologies? They solved the fundamental problem that broke gate arrays in the first place, which is, everyone know? The problem with gate arrays was I.O., right? Uh, you know, in order, at the level of integration that gate arrays were targeting, you needed to be able to interface with the analog world. You had to be able to have FIs and all those kinds of things. And so this business, FPGAs, actually did a really good job of building flexible I.O. structures. And so these new generation gate arrays simply have programmable I.O. I mean by programmable I.O., I mean they can do, you know, 10 gigabit SIRDES on the same pins that they do something else, right? So it's still very difficult, challenging electrical design. But it's the kind of thing that you can do. Now, are they cheap? No, they're not cheap. Of course they're not cheap. But you can get them done very, very quickly. And then, then you optimize for cost, right? You get the prototype done, you learn from the market, and then if you've got a, a decent platform, it should be relatively easy to, to spin that into a more optimized um, ASIC. About six weeks ago, um, Sonics and some other companies announced a, uh, a new conversation. Um, we're very interested in the application of techniques that have been developed in the software community around agile design and how they may be able to help form the backbone of some new methodologies that we could apply in the, in the world of these um, ASIC SOCs. And so I would encourage you all to consider you know, helping contribute your ideas into this forum. Um, there's a, there's a, a group on LinkedIn, and I think there's going to be some, you know, some more press around this in the near future. But you know, take a look and see if there's you know, ideas that, that you find interesting in that space. I think one of the interesting things is many of these systems companies, of course, having a much more software-centric viewpoint, have been, very, have been adopting these agile techniques for other parts of their design for quite a while. And so I think it's something that's natural for them. Tools are important. Um, you know, we're trying to do our part to try to help the, these new ASIC architects uh, do their job. This summer we introduced 
a new version um, of our um, graphical user interface um, that's designed in a very, very different way from what we've done for the past 15 years, I guess. Um, what we did is we rethought how people wanted to interact with the information that they're working with around our IP. Our IP is unusual in that it's massively configurable. And so the purpose of the UI is to try to help abstract the power and choice, if you will, in a way that can allow people to work. Um, and in this case, we decided that there, that there really were good reasons why different people would want to engage with these choices in different ways. And so we went ahead and, and built something that gives you many different ways to work with it. Um, pictures are always very valuable, and so you can, you know, you can interact with your, with your uh, IP configuration using a, a nice schematic view. Um, some information is just more readily handled and managed in the form of tables, and so we built a rich table editor into here, which is, allows you to copy and paste from Microsoft Excel and sort and filter and all kinds of really clever stuff. Um, What's actually being created is a metadata file that describes the configuration of the IP and the interconnection of our IP into the customer's IP. And you can interact with that metadata directly in a context-sensitive editor because there are some times when a text editor is just the best way to get it done. And this one's good because it has syntax highlighting and autocompletion and all those things you'd like to have. So if you can't remember the name of that net, it can autocomplete it for you. And then what our customer, our existing customers are most excited about is it has a fully, uh, full access to this, all of these views from a scriptable tickle console, which allows you to um, you know, query any value out of the configuration database and do simple things like, you know, please give me all the 64-bit ports because I want to check and make sure that they all have the trust zone security bit enabled. That would be a very, very simple you know, little tickle script that one could write. Um, and, of course, people, people have been building some pretty interesting things there. And maybe the most important thing of this is this is all fully integrated into a nice Eclipse environment. Again, Eclipse is a technology that's very, very comfortable to the system design companies because this is, Eclipse is a standard technology around which you know, things like IDEs and things have been built for many, many years. Um, and so it, being a very open technology, it's easy for customers to add their own plugins or, you know, interact with the, you know, bridge this into their existing IDE systems to, to make, this, make things easier. And then on the integration side, um, we asked ourselves, gosh, it's kind of scary, this whole idea of IoT and wearables. These sound like small chips. You know, we've been investing a lot of money building these relatively complex products for these high-end things, you know, would anyone really want to use something as complex as a, as a, as a NOC in a, in a design as simple as a wearable design? And then we asked ourselves, well, maybe it's not so simple. So uh, this is a, a case study from one of our um, current customer engagements. Um, their wearable processor is actually pretty complex, not in terms of total number of IP components being integrated, not in terms of total gate count, but it's a wearable thing. It's got to be really optimum from a power perspective. And so it's got a pretty large number of you know, clocking and power domains, even for such a simple design. Why? Because these things are completely measured based upon how long the battery lasts. And so they need to be able to keep as much of this thing shut off all the time as they can afford to. And they want to turn on only those little bits which are needed for the task at hand and then shut them back off as quickly as possible. So it's actually relatively, for, you know, for a pretty simple design, it's only like 21 by 6, um, it's got an awfully large number of domains. In their prior incarnation, they were hooking things up using kind of, you know, standard, uh, you know, AMBA components, you know, AMBA, AMBA crossbars and things like that. Um, when we replace that with a, with a technology like our, our latest generation SGN NOC, um, what we found is that some of the things that we were designing in for these higher end things were really, really important to this class of application. Like the ability to easily partition the fabric so that the components in the network live in the power domains with the things that they're connected to. So that when you turn off something you're connected to, you get turned off as well. One of the metrics that um, people who are trying, really worried about the battery life of their chip focus a lot on is what is the idle power? What's the power when the thing's not doing anything but is just kind of hanging around waiting for something to happen? And 
you know, that power is often dominated by the number of transistors that are in what they call the always-on domain, the part of the chip that always has power if any of it has power. And um, if you go back to the original architecture, they really had no choice because of, of how these, these uh, crossbar technologies worked but to partition around the fabric so the fabric was completely in the always-on domain. And in fact, the uh, asynchronous clock boundaries were also driven to be in that domain as well. Um, by being able to take advantage of the, the techniques that we've you know, pioneered in our network, which is the ability to cross power domain boundaries is just a function of the network links, um, we were able to save 80% of the area in the always-on domain, which you know, has a, a very, very direct and positive impact on the overall battery life of the system. And yeah, we also saved some, some gate area on the fabric. I don't think in the context of one of these designs that saving you know, 35% of the gates is really that big a deal, but saving 80% of the idle power, that's a big deal. So that would be one example. So in summary, um, I hope I've convinced you that this Makimoto's wave thing has crashed over us again. I know we've all felt it in terms of the, the migration of design activities away from large semiconductor companies, but I believe that's moving not principally to small semiconductor companies. I think most of this design activity is going to move principally into systems companies. Um, so they are either enticed, you know, Apple wasn't forced to design the A series of application processors. They were enticed to do it. They thought they could add um, value in their platforms by doing so, and I think they've proven that they did. Um, Others are being forced to design ASICs again. The guys in the base station space might have been happier just buying those ASSPs if only TI and the other guys would have kept making them, but the economics didn't work out. I think it's a huge opportunity for all of us to figure out how, what role we can play and how we can help these companies get back into the game. Thank you. <laughs>